Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and it's my pleasure to rise today as the chairperson to move this motion on the Culture, Arts and Leisure Committee's investigation into gaps in child protection and safeguarding across the CAL remit. I would like to thank the other members of the committee and the committee staff for the considerable work that they have put into this important investi investigation report. I would also like to thank all the individuals and groups who contributed to the investigation with either written submissions or giving evidence before the committee. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am sure that all members here this afternoon will agree that the protection and safeguarding of children and other vulnerable groups is a cross-cutting issue that should be a priority for all departments and ministers. And members will also be aware of my own personal interest and commitment in this matter. I welcome the fact that the Culture, Arts and Leisure Minister is here today to respond to the motion, and I am aware that she and her officials have followed the evidence phase of the investigation closely and have contributed to it. It is also gratifying for the committee that the Minister's departmental officials have already undertaken actions in response to the committee's work. The committee's objective in undertaking this investigation was to seek gaps in child protection and safeguarding across the culture, arts and leisure remit, to identify examples of best practice in this area and, by comparing these, make recommendations to the Minister of Culture, Arts and Leisure with respect to highlighting any gaps and suggesting how they might be mitigated. In meeting this objective, the Committee sought to identify the excellent work being done across the CAL remit with respect to the protection and safeguarding of vulnerable groups. Members then considered how this best practice might be developed into standardised formats, processes and procedures. The Committee received a briefing on the work of the Child Protection in, in Sport Unit, or CPSU, back in November 2012. And this became the focus of this investigation, which the Committee started earlier this year. Mr Deputy Speaker, throughout the evidence gathering process, the Committee heard individuals and organisations acknowledge the excellent work undertaken by the CPSU and the standards and best practice which have been established in sport as a result. Members saw how the CPSU encouraged sporting organisations to apply six key principles for best practice in the protection and safeguarding of vulnerable groups. Those are recruitment good practice, effective management of volunteers and staff, reporting, codes of, of, codes of behaviour, sharing information and general safety and management. The protection and safeguarding standards which the CPSU have helped to establish in sport have taken considerable effort to achieve. However, members realised early on in this investigation that these standards represent best practice which can be used to identify gaps and remedy these in other sectors. The Committee was also conscious in this investigation of the individuals and groups which operate privately and outside the system, particularly self-employed persons. They are not part of the regulation process and the Committee believes that efforts must be made to reach out to them. We were also mindful of the policies, networks and frameworks for the protection and safeguarding of vulnerable groups that exist outside the CAL remit and believe that the recommendations coming from this report must acknowledge these. In undertaking this investigation, the Committee sought examples of best practice to share across the CAL family and to support the Department of Culture, Arts and Leisure in developing a more joined-up approach to these issues. During the investigation, the Committee widened out its consideration to include all vulnerable groups, not solely children. The Committee agreed to proceed with an investigation rather than a full inquiry so that the evidence gathering process could be undertaken over a more condensed period and would be specifically focused. Mr Deputy Speaker, during the evidence gathering process, the Committee received written submissions and heard oral evidence from a wide variety of organisations, groups and bodies, including the Department, its arm's length bodies, the NSPCC and the CPSU, Volunteer Now, the Police Service of Northern Ireland, the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland, the Child Exploitation and Online Protection Centre, or SEOP, and a range of stakeholder groups from across the remit. At the outset of the Committee's investigation, the Department indicated that it would be a willing partner in the process and would give detailed consideration to the Committee's findings. The Committee looks forward to hearing from the Minister about how her officials will proceed. As I have already said, there are many private tutors and small groups operating across the CAL remit who are unregulated and unaffiliated. 
These individuals and groups are often unsure about protection and safeguarding issues, and the committee would like to reach out to them. Additionally, many organisations that are part of the system and have policies and procedures are still unsure as to how they should be implemented or applied, or would benefit from advice or guidance tailored to their sector. Again, the committee wants to find ways to reach out to them. Members are also concerned about the challenges presented to vulnerable groups, parents and teachers by the internet and social media, and would like to identify ways in which these challenges can be mitigated. The committee has heard a great deal through this investigation about the challenges and benefits presented by the internet and social media. Members are very keen that collective action is taken by the executive in a number of areas with reference to this, particularly in light of the tragic results of abuse and cyberbullying. The committee has recommended a number of measures to be taken forward in the CAL remit, but most notably a charter mark standard. Members believe that this standard has the potential to be rolled out across other sectors following a successful CAL sector pilot. There are already examples of this sort of charter mark, such as the IFA's club mark, Northern Ireland. Such a charter mark would provide a brand for protection and safeguarding that could be awarded to organisations which meet recognised standards and best practice. It could act as a seal of approval, allowing parents and volunteers to know that an organisation has considered these issues and is managing them to a specific standard. Members have further recommended various forms of awareness are raising around protection and safeguarding to publicise the sources of information and help available. As I've already indicated, there is a role for the executive to play in combating issues around the internet and social media. However, there's also a significant role for educating parents, carers, teachers, at-risk groups and young people in the safe use of the internet and social media. Another key issue of the that the committee has considered during this investigation and which has been emphasised by a number of contributors is that of protecting the volunteers and others who undertake work with children and other vulnerable adults. Members believe that it is extremely important to ensure that these people understand how to protect themselves so that organisations which work with vulnerable groups can still attract staff and volunteers. Mr Deputy Speaker, returning to the excellent work of the CPSU, the Committee has recommended that the Department examines the idea of developing similar units in the arts and culture sectors. It is important that a successful model like the CPSU is replicated as part of the process of creating standardisation, standardised protection and safeguarding of vulnerable groups. While the committee made specific reference to children and young people in the objective and terms of reference for this investigation, members are clear that this issue extends to a much wider group of people. The committee is believed that protection and safeguarding policies and procedures should be cognizant of and specifically clarify the range of groups to which protection and safeguarding should apply. Vulnerable groups is a phrase that the committee heard a number of times during evidence sessions and members believe that it is important that the safeguarding policies and procedures ensure there is clarity that this generic phrase includes all children and young people and also adults with disabilities, with special needs or with other vulnerabilities and those with greater exposure to risk of harm. Paul Stevenson of the CPSU highlighted to the committee during the investigation there is a need to motivate organisations that want to do things, teach people give them skills and so on. They need to be up to up their game. It is about professional support mechanisms whereby they can download forms, information and guidance and access training that is specific to their sector. It is about supporting the voluntary sector. It is not about saying you have to go and do this, but we do not have any answers for you. Mr Deputy Speaker, Paul is absolutely right. We must provide people with the right tools to ensure that they undertake protection and safeguarding properly. The best way to close gaps in the protection and safeguarding of vulnerable groups is to work together as a network with clear structures for information sharing. Members are keen that this networking should also involve the churches and faith groups and local government. A significant element in closing gaps in the protection and safeguarding of vulnerable groups is awareness. As well as the committee's recommendation of a CAL Chartermark standard pilot, there must be a wider awareness raising campaign. 
Other executive min ministers may be able to help the minister inform such a campaign. The charter mark and campaign should also act to highlight protection and safeguarding requirements to self-employed persons and unregulated groups. A significant aid to better understanding and practical use of policies and procedures for the protection and safeguarding of vulnerable groups is that they are standardised, and local government could and should play a key role in this. In recognition of the electronic world in which we all live, the Committee has recommended that the Department plays a full part in the Executive's development of an e-strategy and should consider one of its own for the Cal family. The Committee also believes that there is a need for a safeguarding portal. This would be a link leading from websites where one might go to seek information on protection and safeguarding to a website which give, would give the most up-to-date policy and procedural information. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Committee believes that the development by the IFA of a smartphone application that does something similar to the portal link should be assessed and considered for a wider rollout. Similarly, the Committee sees the need for the Department to develop an acceptable users policy and a code of conduct for communication with young people through any form of social media with guidelines about when and how young people should be communicated with. This would give those working with children and young people a more tangible basis on which to conduct relationships. As a model of best practice, the Committee has recommended that safeguarding and protection of vulnerable groups is a permanent agenda for the Department's accountability meetings with the all arm's length bodies. The Department must also hold records of any concerns regarding protection and safeguarding that have been raised with the ALBs and any subsequent action that is taken. Additionally, the Committee has recommended that the Department and relevant ALBs should develop a model for an audit of organisations within the arts and culture sectors, and this would examine the policies and procedures that bodies in the sectors have in place to protect and safeguard vulnerable groups. These audits should be taken forward as soon as is practical. The establishment of a young person reference group would give young people a voice in key policies and strategies, including the development of policies and procedures for protection and safeguarding. The committee would suggest that this group might work effectively on a virtual basis and could again be part of a charter mark standard pilot within the CAL sector. It's important that this group takes cognizance of existing frameworks for advice and cooperation and to avoid the duplication of work. The committee has recommended that the department takes this forward. Liaison with the Commissioner for Children and Young People should ensure that the group does not duplicate the work of other bodies and that it is plugged into appropriate networks. The Committee gave a great deal of consideration to the position of volunteers during the investigation. Members believe that people can be put off volunteering um, to work with vulnerable groups as protection and safeguarding policies and procedures can be off-putting and intimidating. Mr Deputy Speaker, to offset this, the Committee has recommended that the Department engages with relevant networks and stakeholders and with existing frameworks to promote and disseminate specific guidance for volunteers working with vulnerable groups, thus allowing them to be sufficiently knowledgeable and secure to undertake volunteering and providing an environment of information which will encourage new volunteers. The Committee is acutely aware that issues around the protection and safeguarding of vulnerable groups are very fluid and are constantly changing, particularly in the areas of internet and social media. And this is why members have recommended that training and retraining for those working with vulnerable groups within the CAL remit should be set within specific time frames, probably every two years, to ensure relevance. To underpin much of what the committee has recommended in this investigation, members have also recommended that the department establishes a memorandum of understanding with the SBNI or, if more appropriate, six membership of one or more of the SBNI's committees. The Committee believes that this investigation has been extremely worthwhile and that members' recommendations will help to close some of the gaps in the protection and safeguarding of vulnerable groups that this investigation has helped to identify. Mr Deputy Speaker, I look forward to an interesting and useful debate and I commend the Committee's investigation report to the House and I beg to move the motion. Thank you. Call Ms. Rosalie McCarley. While I'm talking to you, I wish to speak in support of this motion. 
Maratarach Hanafin, the CAL Committee's investigation into gaps in child protection and safeguarding across its remit arose out of a briefing from the NSPCC a year ago on the work of its Child Protection Support Unit. The CPSU has a record of excellent work in this area, and the six best practice standards which have been ex- established in sport are an example of this. The committee decided that it was appropriate to undertake an investigation across the remit of culture, arts and leisure to seek out any existing gaps given the wide range of bodies, organisations, small groups and private agencies, all of whom operate in the field of children and vulnerable people. While the large agencies and arm's length bodies are well established in terms of policy development and the adoption of appropriate processes and procedures, it is however also the case that there are many smaller groups and private individuals who operate in an unregulated way. Kegwil Kurami Aku Kumai, a Kinchu Gwel Shadik Femu, Inoyana, a Dugan Kosan Shitafwashi, Augustinium Wheel, Neil Shay, a Goni Silyar, Gajemara Tashin, Janta Aku. While they also have responsibilities in ensuring that they are operating in ways which safeguard children and vulnerable people, it is not always clear how they do this. In recognition of that, the Committee sought to reach out to such groups to offer advice and guidance focused on that sector. The piece of investigative work undertaken by the Committee involved taking evidence from a range of groups over a period of months. This has been a valuable exercise and the committee was impressed by the work that many organisations have been involved in to ensure they are fulfilling their responsibilities. A notable aspect of the process has been an involving backdrop to that work, which continued to inform the committee on the importance of developing policy in this area. It also illustrated the serious and complex nature of safeguarding children and vulnerable people. That backdrop, Mr Speaker, has been the revelations of instances of abuse by celebrities which was visited on young vulnerable people over many decades, most notable of which was the Savile case. Such examples had the effect of clarifying and emphasising the absolute requirement for establishing best practice in all cases where people are involved in work or leisure that brings them into contact with children or any vulnerable person. What also arose as a specific area of concern was the evolving world of social media and internet sites. The undeniable benefits of the internet were acknowledged and accepted, alongside a need for proper safeguards and protections to ensure that the young and vulnerable are not harmed, manipulated or compromised. On that issue, the Committee took evidence from Wayne Denner, who delivers workshop on cyberbullying and appropriate online behaviour. Wayne talks about the impact of cyberbullying and has become a key advisor on awareness and strategies for prevention aimed at educators, parents and community organisations who work with young people. His contribution to this ongoing and ever-changing issue is extremely important. The Committee believes that the best way to close gaps in the protection and safeguarding of vulnerable groups is for key stakeholders to work together with clear structures for information sharing. It is vital also that training, advice, policies and procedures are standardised. Tashi Rekta Nakumai, Gwil Trainail, Kolya, Policyha, Agus Nosna Imakta, Kurha, or One Kaijanaha. Specifically, there is a need for a clear brand, a bent a charter mark standard to identify best practice which organisations and bodies should aim towards. People working at an individual level need protection and guidance and should be identified using an awareness campaign. A website link similar to that used by SEOP should direct individuals or groups to the most relevant up-to-date advice and information. A safeguarding smartphone app such as that brought forward by the IFA should also be developed. As previously stated, the role of education, educating children and young people, teachers and parents in the positive use of the internet and social media is vital. These actions could all be piloted under the CAL remit with a clear focus on the Charter Mark standard. On a final note, it is vital also to emphasise the need for continuous staff training across all organisations and agencies in safeguarding and protecting children and vulnerable people. In undertaking this investigation, I believe the committee has shown leadership and responsibility. Agus and Kostya Amon and Taija Shaw, Kredjim Gurleri Shay, Groshay and Nairira, Ohiv Kionarakta, Agus Frey, Grakpija, Mullum and Rinshaw. Karamayogut. Call Ms. Karen McKevitt.
Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I am pleased to contribute to today's uh, committee motion. The safeguarding and protection of children, young adults and vulnerable people is of paramount importance. Children and young people have the right to be safe, the right to be protected, and we as public representatives are duty bound to ensure that these rights are extended to every single child, young adult and vulnerable person. As previously mentioned, the NSPCC briefed the committee in November 2012 on the excellent work of its child protection in sport unit. I would like to thank the NSPCC for meeting with the committee on this occasion, as the briefing highlighted to the committee the need for an investigation into the gaps that might exist regarding child protection in the CAL remit. The investigation identified that some arm length bodies and funded groups do have child protection policies and procedures. Others have policies in place, but uncertainty exists about how these policies would be implemented and many groups and private tutors do not have policies in place. It has also been identified that many groups of private tutors have received no advice or guidance on how to effectively deal with child protection. The differences in approaches to child protection is concerning and must be rectified. After careful consideration of evidence submitted by relevant bodies, the committee agreed that a standardised system of best practice should be implemented across the CAL remit including private groups and tutors. The recommendations of a charter mark standard for the protection and safeguarding of vulnerable groups should be given full consideration by the Department. For the charter mark standard to be successful in have to be widely implemented across the CAL family. An effective awareness campaign should be launched and information on best practice standards must be readily available. I hope the Department will consider implementing the Charter Mark Standard as a pilot, which can then be rolled out throughout various other departments. I must say that I recognise the Department's support for this investigation to date, and I am pleased to hear that this investigation prompted the Department to reinstate its own Child Protection Working Group. I would urge the Department to give due consideration to the NSPCC recommendation that a body such as Child Protection in Sport should be developed for the arts. Over the last number of years, we have seen an increase in the information of arts and culture groups, and I would ask the Department to support the creation of such a body in order to sufficiently protect all children and vulnerable people, as well as tutors, mentors and, of course, our volunteers. Living in a digital era, the Committee recognises that child protection online is very difficult to monitor. The recommendation of an e-strategy carries merit, and I would further propose that training sessions be offered to groups, tutors in public buildings, such as our libraries. A digital expert from my own constituency, Wayne Denier, previously visited the committee to speak about online safety. Specialists such as Wayne should roll out training on how to keep children, young adults and vulnerable safe when online. I would like to finish by commending the committee clerk, Peter Hall, and the whole committee support team for all their work throughout this investigation. We are very grateful to you. Thank you. I call Ms Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, on behalf of the Alliance Party, I want to make a few comments on this comprehensive report and commend the COW Committee for conducting uh, this very worthy investigation. Following the disclosure of sexual abuses per perpetrated by SAFO and other celebrities, with many reports not being examined properly, by the authorities, we must learn the lesson in listening to what children and young people tell us and take actions to investigate allegations of abuse, regardless of who the alleged perpetrator is. I totally endorse the committee's view that the best way to close gaps in the protection and safeguarding of vulnerable groups is for all statutory and voluntary agencies, including church organisations, to work together as a network with clear structures for information sharing. The creation of the Safeguarding Board NI last year provides that type of coordinating platform where different agencies can work in a more coherent manner. I support the Committee's innovative recommendation for the development of a charter mark standard to be piloted initially in the cow sector. 
we have universal benchmarks such as investors in people. So why not a recognised brand for best practice in child protection? I'm sure the sector will welcome such an initiative, particularly as the report indicates it may be beneficial to the self-employed individuals who tutor music or coach uh, sports in a private capacity outside of any regulated structure. I agree with the report that the sports sector has established good systems in the protection of vulnerable groups over the years, and it is important that such good practice is extended to the arts and culture sector. And I therefore welcome the committee's recommendation that the department works with the Arts Council and other culture bodies to establish a model for an audit of organisations looking into the policies and procedures put in place within the sector. I also support the recommendation that the department and all its relevant arms length bodies seek to establish an equivalent of the child protection in sport unit for the arts and culture sector. The committee also recommends that the department engages with relevant <coughs> networks to promote and disseminate specific guidance of volunteers working with vulnerable groups. I wish to take this opportunity, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to pay tribute to the thousands of volunteers in our communities, yeah. helping in sports and arts activities. Without them, many clubs or organizations simply cannot function. At this point, I want to raise a concern from a constituent of mine who is a volunteer with a sports club. Whilst he fully acknowledges the importance of knowledge for volunteers, and he himself has completed all the necessary training courses, he is concerned that some organizations, including some sports governing bodies, are refusing to recognize the generic keeping children safe course provided by, uh, uh, by youth nets and other uh, as being the adequate requirement for volunteers. He is unhappy that volunteers are being charged to obtain the necessary certificate and are therefore out of pocket. He believes this should not be the case. According to my constituent, what seems to have happened is that a cottage industry, as he calls it, uh, in training volunteers has developed with a lack of central regulation. I understand he has made inquiries with the safeguarding board, but was told that the board is powerless to oblige organizations not to charge for training. Perhaps the minister could shed some light on this issue later on in the debate. I support the motion. Thank you. Call Mr. William Humphrey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And as colleagues have said, um, in December 2012, the DECAL committee agreed to conduct an investigation into the gaps in child protection and safeguarding across the culture, arts and leisure remit here in Northern Ireland. And from January and May of this year, written submissions and oral evidence were received from a whole range of organisations, as the Chair has said, within the DECAL family, but also organisations such as Volunteer Now, Northern Ireland Association of Social Work Workers, the NSPCC, the churches and faith-based organisations, and also community organisations such as the Ulster Scots Community Network, Forest and Gaelica, Swim Ireland, the GEA, the Irish Football Association, and the Ulster branch of the Irish Rugby Football Union. And therefore, a huge wealth of, of information comprehensively given is now available to the committee. This piece of work followed the committee's briefing from the NSPCC in November 2012. And I have to say, in my view, as someone involved in youth work, I think it's invaluable for government uh, and for the, for the people of Northern Ireland involved in youth work and youth provision. At this point, I should declare an interest as a member of the Scout Association and, and president of West Belfast District Scout Council. And I would pay tribute to people who are working across our community in terms of the Boys Brigade, the Girls Brigade, scouting, uh, guiding, youth clubs, sports clubs, 
church organisations right across Northern Ireland. We hear politicians on the mainland talking about this big society. Those people are involved in delivering the big society, and many of them at their own cost and to their detriment. And I am concerned, as someone involved in a youth organisation, that we are putting people off becoming volunteers and getting actively involved. And it's vital, therefore, that we protect those people who want to become practitioners on a voluntary basis, but also protect the young people uh, from uh, allegations and from abuse. Whether that abuse and those allegations are involved in state institutions, youth organisations, churches, care homes, sports and youth clubs, or indeed in the home. Mr Deputy Speaker, for a time I served on the OFM DFM committee, and I met with people who were involved in terms of the abuse they received in the uh, institutionalised uh, abuse cases. I spoke to Margaret McGookian, who leads that organisation of victims, and I spoke to some of her colleagues. And some of the stories that they told me in my office were absolutely harrowing and terrifying, that young people were subje subjected to such evil. Stories of cruelty that were just beyond belief. We must do, therefore, all that we can to ensure that such evil is prevented in future. Mr. Speaker, I also serve on the Justice Committee, and you will be aware that the human trafficking bill is coming forward. Again, we need to ensure that Lord Morrow's bill is being scrutinised by that committee, who is there for protection of young people and the vulnerable within our society here in Northern Ireland and across the European Union. I have to say I am concerned that his bill and other protections for young people and those who are vulnerable in our society will not be uh, as protected in Northern Ireland as they perhaps are in the rest of the United Kingdom due to the failure of the National Crime Agency not being fully extended and deployed here in Northern Ireland. The refusal of Sinn Féin to fully support the NCA and the SDLP's objections uh, in, the, in the grounds of accountability will, I believe, in my party's view, leave young people in Northern Ireland more exposed and vulnerable than their counterparts in the rest of the United Kingdom. And I urge these two parties to reconsider their positions. Mr. Speaker, in March 2013, Mr. Peter Davies of SEOP uh, came and spoke to the uh, committee. Mr. Davies advised the DECAL committee that he had the lead position in terms of the Association of Chief Constables on protect Child Protection and Investigations for England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. During his evidence, he advised that it is increasingly difficult to distinguish between online and offline threats. He also outlined that he believed that the definition of child exploitation, he stated, is about vulnerability meeting power. Vulnerability on the part of the victims, power in terms of those who are sexual abusers. In terms of the strategy, see up talk about prevent, protect and the future. In terms of combating abuses, resources are the key, Mr Deputy Speaker, and it is vital for organisations tackling these issues come together, pull resources, share information and expertise, and the political ideologies are set aside in protecting children and vulnerable people, and the NCA Members needs to be extended to Northern Ireland for the, protection, the maximum protection of our young people, the most vulnerable people in our society. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Cahill O'Shin. Good morning, Alas Can Coria, August Tommy, Inta Brodja, August Sasta Vega Glorja, and our Inta Tawak to Shaw and you. By the Commissi, and our Is Tawak to Ave and Kusha Shaw and Clay. I'm very pleased and happy to be speaking on this matter here today, probably the most important subject that has come before the committee to date. The motion is in foot of the investigation on gaps in child protection and safeguarding across the Cal remit but has been stretched in part to represent those covered by the generic phrase vulnerable groups. The committee agreed in December 2012 to investigate gaps that did exist, and the investigation was later widened out, and this is to be welcomed. The committee did receive representations during the investigation from our arms length bodies and many other organisations and individuals in the sector. Another major concern for which there has been limited discussion on is the relatively new medium of the internet and social media. This presents particular identification procedures and mitigating measures. It also challenges all who deal with children and the vulnerable to be aware of an ever-moving target. OFM and DFM are engaged across the executive to look at a particular aspects pertinent to carers, teachers, parents and at-risk groups. And this must be supported by better uh, evidence and information. 
The excellent standards that do exist, particularly within the child protection in terms of Club My for the GAA and Club Mark in rugby and soccer, must be replicated across the board, avoiding duplication, and we encourage the Minister to instigate this. Protection must also be given for those who give freely and willingly of their time and expertise on a voluntary basis for the benefit of wider society. Encouragement of organisations in this field is also a necessary requirement given the number of high-profile TV and celebrity cases of child abuse that there have been to date and the effect that these have had on the whole of society. The committee does recommend the installation of a charter mark that might uh, be ruled out, ruled out across all sectors, including local government and the community and voluntary sectors. A complementary awareness campaign should also be indicated. Hopefully these safeguards will be followed through, up, until and post RPA and be established in any future local authority governance. This investigation has been central to the development of an overall e-strategy that should ensure the needs of vulnerable groups and parents are addressed. The committee would encourage the Minister to engage with the AFA, the Irish Football Association, whose Safeguard and Smartphone app is lauded as a pioneer development worldwide. The education sector too has its role to play, the role of the Arts Council and cultural bodies in drawing up an audit of organisations within the arts and cultural sector, and also in carrying out periodic reviews as well as a two-yearly strategic audit to keep all participating organisations up to date with best practice. A biennial uh, conference should also be organised to focus minds and exchange information, probably in sync with any review. As I said at the outset, this is a major piece of work that is long overdue and welcome. I hope the House can unite in support of this investigation to Sulagam, Gwilmudge, Abota, Chaktihila, Evavar and Fisrahan Ogsan Bolishaw. Go to me the Margaret, I will ask you to call Mr Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I would like to welcome this report by the um, CAL Committee. Uh, I have to say, at the outset, I, I was surprised by its, its topic. I wasn't aware the investigation was going on, but it's very clear from the, the recommendations that are coming that there was a need for it, and the Committee has indeed, indeed identified gaps in the current provision. So I would like to commend the Committee for having done so. Um, it's important that Every department and every organisation uh, recognise, recognises their responsibility in terms of their protection uh, of children and young people and indeed vulnerable adults. So I therefore welcome some of the uh, uh, recommendations that have come forward. The uh, such a proposal that there would be a, an awareness campaign for those working particularly in, in the arts sector uh, must be welcomed to ensure that people are fully aware of, of their responsibilities. I see also in terms of those who are working as self-employed in the area, uh, again, sometimes uh, small groups can forget that the responsibility falls with them. And when someone who's self-employed comes in, it's important that they uh, are adequately uh, trained and regulated as well. Uh, and sometimes that aspect can be overlooked. So it's right that this aspect is highlighted. I would ask the Minister to uh, uh, investigate as to how uh, those who may be working with and multiple groups can be uh, facilitated in, in a more efficient manner um, because there is some practical difficulties in declaring interest uh, myself as a, a BB officer and a member of the Carrick Fergus Community Drugs and Alcohol Advisory Group. I had to go through two different sets of child protection assessments just as many others in the community have to. And it does seem to be bureaucratic that having been cleared that even perhaps within weeks you would have to submit another fresh application when the same criteria is assessed uh, and an assessment of someone's suitability is, is determined. Uh, I would have thought we do need to move towards a degree of individual assessment which could be a passport provided that's checked up in a reasonably short period but particularly if you look at self-employed persons who, who are maybe working in this art sector uh, they may have to go through uh, clearance with each individual group that they may be working with unless uh, 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 sorry, sorry the, unless the group was actually facilitated it was from someone who has already cleared and to agree who can supervise them whilst they would be working so that would be a very practical uh, uh, barrier that would exist and uh, a positive suggestion, I, I believe, in terms of improving 
uh, uh, the facilities. So I am pleased that the committee has carried out this investigator and highlighted some of the difficulties in the area and hopefully improvement will occur as a result. Call Mr Mervyn Story, Chairperson of the Education Committee. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker and can I uh, open my comments as Chair of the Education Committee. Um, let me first begin by commending the Committee for Culture, Arts and Leisure for undertaking this investigation uh, and producing uh, the report that we have in front of us today. And can I also place on record uh, the appreciation of many in this House to the work that has been undertaken by the Chair of the Committee, not only in the role that she carries out in regards to the Committee, but also in championing, I believe, uh, what is a very serious issue. Uh, uh, and an issue that she has very passionately raised uh, over a long period of time, and I want to place that on record. But most of the recommendations appear, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, to fall uh, into the remit of the, either the, de the DECAL or the Health Department or indeed OFM, DFM. But that said, there were certainly elements of this report which are uh, of considerable interest to the Education Committee and to the Education Department. The CAL Committee in its deliberations has highlighted, for example, how a significant proportion of pastoral care issues dealt with by teachers appear to relate to social media problems, both bullying and inappropriate sexual content and contact. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a worrying, if sadly unsurprising, finding of the CAL Committee's investigation. I note that the C2K providers monitor access to the internet to schools and that this is subject to a detailed filtering uh, policy which categorises websites into groups which are allowed or not allowed. This filtering process is updated several times daily, either as a result of requests from schools or as new sites appear on the internet. I wonder, Mr Deputy Speaker, if in the wind to the debate uh, this afternoon, the Deputy Chair of the Committee might confirm that the cyberbullying issues covered in the report are not linked to school-based internet access. I anticipate uh, but would value confirmation that these issues are linked to mobile phone or home-based access. Mr Deputy uh, Speaker, in respect of an overarching strategy for child protection online, I think we can all agree with the CAL Committee that there is a key role for the Executive to play. That said, there is also a significant task for departments, including education, to undertake in order to educate parents, teachers, at-risk groups and pupils in the safe use of the internet and social media. As we are aware, the Education Committee is currently undertaking an inquiry into the Education and the Training Inspectorate and will, I am sure, note with interest the reference to the ETI's monitoring of child protection and awareness of schools' ICT policy. Uh, for example, pre-inspection of parental questionnaires which are carried out. And I believe that this is another very useful uh, factual insight provided by this report which will inform the Education Committee should your considerations of these matters. And I intend to have this matter raised uh, for consideration at the Committee uh, this week. Turning in conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, as a member of this House and the DUP's Education uh, Spokesperson, can I say that I am disappointed that it would seem from reading this report that there are those in this House who are prepared to allow their political prejudice, prejudice uh, to uh, mask or to cover uh, what is an evil in our society uh, in terms of exposing and going after those who would sexually exploit our children. And I refer to the inevitable consequence of the establishment of the National Crime Agency, which was referred to by my colleague Mr Humphreys, and CEOP will be uh, transferred into that organisation. And given the key role that CEOP plays in regards to uh, keeping our children and young people and vulnerable groups safe, I think that those parties opposite who have played politics with this issue need to really look at their conscience today and really question where they are going with this matter and if they are really interested in protecting children, step up to the plate and not only by words and platitudes but by actions show to the House and show to families that they are supportive of what is contained in this report today. 
And I would also say that I'm somewhat disappointed that it seems as though the Ulster Unionists have come to this ill-informed. Uh, I wonder just what their members Member were doing on the committee close, that couldn't inform the rest of the party as to the importance of this issue. So therefore, I commend uh, the committee and what they've done and I members look forward time is up. for action from members opposite rather than just words. Thank you, Mr. Deputy. I call Mr. Oliver McMullen. At its meeting of the 13th of December 2012, the decal committee decided to conduct an investigation into gaps in child protection and safeguarding across the decal remit. During the investigation, the committee decided to wide out to include all vulnerable groups. This includes adults and children. The committee decided an investigation rather than a full inquiry so that the evidence can be gathered over a more specific time frame and that it would be specifically focused. The evidence presented to the committee, both oral and written, oral evidence came from a wide range of groups, including decals, arms, and bodies, including Sports NI, the Arts, NSPCC, uh, etc., and from other groups such as uh, GAA, Ulster Scots, Rugby, and Football. But as the evidence was being gathered and presented to the committee, it became very clear that the quality of both the written and oral evidence was varied and of a very good standard, but at the same time was clear that not everybody was working with the same policies and standards which the committee agreed presented a major problem. Another vitally imp important part of the investigation centred around vulnerable groups. This section dealt with, with children and adults who have disability or special needs. And it was clear from the presentation the majority of those groups that accepted the title of vulnerable groups within their own policies. But in reality, when they were questioned at the committee, could tell very little about comp the complex needs, the, com uh, the complex situations, and, and, and the vulnerability of those uh, children and adults within vulnerable groups. And this uh, is, a, is a major gap, because there's no sense accepting, accepting one title uh, uh, within this, uh, this whole uh, evidence gathering if we don't know exactly what we're talking about. Councils play a major, a major part in communities, especially in the rural areas and in the protection of vulnerable groups. Their premises, more than anybody, are used by thousands of vulnerable children and adults and groups that take part in council organised events. But councils also lease their premises to groups and individuals that run activities for both vulnerable and able bodied adults and children. Therefore, it is vital that their representative body, NILGA, make sure that all councils can implement the same good protection and safeguarding policies not only for themselves, but also for those who rent or lease council properties to run events that would include the disabled. The committee recognised that the department has no remit with local government, but sees RPA as a golden chance to have this imbalance changed, and no better time now to do that. I, I, I spent 23, 24 years in local government, and in reality I never saw the policies changing. Staff and, st staff, no, no, I'm nearly finished. staff and management in these premises also need to be brought into line. It is known that around 80 per cent of council staff have contact with the public. Once staff are vetted and cleared to work, it is unfortunate that there is little or no formal ongoing training to allow them to recognise and deal with vulnerable groups or individuals in as far as their complex needs or behaviour problems. We have cases in the past where uh, children with behaviour problems are actually been asked to leave premises because they are disruptive. This is because those dealing with that did not know the complexity of that child or individual. And would have to ask when a group applies books, uh, books a facility within a, a building, how many times is management asked for the, complex, the complexity of the needs of those children or adults that are coming in? This again, I see this as a gap. It was after listening to the evidence that the committee recommended there should be one policy or charter mark for everyone, and this to be introduced by the Minister across the department and when successful, should be implemented through all the departments and their armed dense bodies, including, including councils. 
But can I say that I was disappointed here today that the, the, the word of politics was mentioned of, of, the, of ourselves here, it indicated that we were playing politics with this. That's sad because in the whole, in the whole uh, inquiry through the uh, decal committee, politics never once raised its head. Member of Charlie's remarks. And I think it was a very please. cheap shot at those people who are who, who are vulnerable, and we should uh, we should be doing members, all we can to help them. Call Mr. Dominic Bradley. Kermila Mayo got the last concorde. I guess Iriams are no card shall the tachyat a horse done ruin. Falsium Rivenara and so new. I guess Tamakinche. Kermila Jabal the dull conkin tawachtak yenu. Erin Kisht, Ira Hisha. Falchi and Foster reveal to Naturish Kisha, Erin Barney at on a Gosunch Lani, Dini Galunacha, August Dini Oga, Snahagriati at Tafi Kurum, the Rinna, Kultur, Aliena, August Foliata. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I rise to support the motion and welcome the publication of the committee's report into the gaps in child protection and safeguarding. And uh, I thank the committee staff for all the work that they have done in uh, compiling the report, uh, which is based on evidence given to the committee uh, over the course of the last year or so uh, from a wide variety of organisations. And uh, could I thank the, the chair of the committee for the interest that she has taken in the subject and for the comprehensive uh, account of the report that she gave at the beginning of this debate. Uh, I, may, I may not have the time to uh, go into uh, matters in that uh, amount of detail, but uh, I, I can say that the committee uh, and the department, and indeed this assembly, obviously uh, take uh, child protection and safeguarding take it very seriously, and that is only but right. Uh, and I think it is uh, useful uh, to do what the committee has done here, to highlight the organisations across society who, who follow and, in some cases, exceed uh, best practice. Uh, and in the same vein, I think we need to examine where there are shortcomings, where there are gaps, uh, and ensure that those gaps are filled and that we are doing the best that we possibly can to protect and safeguard uh, young people uh, uh, and vulnerable adults. Uh, the report obviously highlights the gaps, and it does, uh, in response to that, make useful and significant recommendations, uh, which the committee uh, wish to see the department uh, implement. Uh, any community organisation or sporting body our organisation who works with children and vulnerable adults uh, are all aware of the stringent requirements placed upon them to ensure child protection uh, and safeguarding are of the highest standards, and that is only but right. Uh, the report sets out a process where we can ensure that those standards are not only met, but also benchmarked across all the sporting and cultural organisations. Uh, which come under the Department of Culture, Arts and Leisure. Uh, and the report suggests that this can be best done through the use of a charter marking system. Uh, the report does highlight the good work of the GA in Ulster through the Club My programme uh, and the IFA through their Club Mark Northern Ireland programme. These organisations have set the bar high and they have set a standard for others to follow. Uh, we must com uh, commend them for doing their work and recognise their standards. However, we cannot become complacent. Uh, the areas of work, the range of areas of work set out in today's uh, re report uh, for those in non-sporting field which are funded and who work to the uh, culture, arts and leisure uh, department uh, are important also. Uh, it, whether they are small groups, uh, organisations as big as the GA or the IFA, uh, or indeed uh, the uh, self-employed individuals who do not fall directly under the regulations, it is important that we expect the highest standards from everyone. 
Um, I hope that the Department will lead the way. Uh, we need to offer help, support and guidance uh, to ensure that we reach the highest of standards and we must professionalise the way we approach the protection of children. And the Chair referred to the quotation from uh, Paul Stevenson of the CPSU. Uh, I, I will not, uh, I will not will bring reiterate remarks it here, to close. Uh, but in the end, I uh, welcome today's report and join with all others in the House. Uh, could I just say that you know, I did regret that the Mr Story and up. others Sorry. chose to politicise the debate. The SDLP will work to achieve the Sorry, type of accountability the that we need time to is get up. a national crime Mr. agency Michael which suits us and which is accountable. Mr. Michael thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I rise to support the motion uh, as a member of Culture, Arts and Leisure. And uh, can I begin by saying, of course, with Mr. Story's remarks, uh, we're, we're well off the mark. My party well understands the importance. Uh, of child protection. For example, when I was the Minister for Health, uh, I was also responsible for social services uh, and became very familiar uh, with the, the difficulties and the problems and the issues uh, that were necessary to protect our children. Around 20,000 referrals every year of children under uh, issues of child protection and about 2,000 children at any one time under the uh, Child Protection Register. And, uh, that was something that uh, we dealt with on an ongoing basis, uh, supporting families and supporting children, and providing uh, uh, that support. Sexual ex exploitation of children, however, uh, the matter of this uh, uh, debate is something different again, uh, uh, whilst uh, children uh, and uh, the, the, the need for children's protection, normally uh, it's a, the, there are issues around what are described as the, the, the holy trinity by social workers, domestic violence, drugs and alcohol, uh, or mental ill health within parents and carers. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, children are neglected, and it's primarily uh, neglect uh, that are the issues for that in, in that area. Sexual exploitation of children, of course, is something entirely different. This is a criminal uh, issue. It is a matter, I believe, first and foremost for police and for criminal justice. It is a matter of apprehending and courts uh, 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 and putting people behind bars as necessary and on the, the, the sex offenders uh, uh, list. And I think that the, the, the steps that we have taken here in our committee and examination, I think clearly uh, uh, adds to that without going through all the points that are made by the committee that have been ably made by the chair and others. There are a number of issues. Obviously, all uh, departments in this uh, executive have a role to play in this, in providing this protection, ensuring that areas within their remit actually uh, are, are fit for purpose in the issue of protecting our children. Uh, when I became Minister of Health, one of the big issues facing us, as uh, colleagues are aware, was suicide, particularly suicide amongst the young. And uh, the way to deal with that, uh, I saw one of the key ways was dealing with suicide chat rooms, which were uh, uh, proliferating on, our, uh, on the internet uh, and through what was then called New Media. And I had meetings with internet providers in London, and their attitude at that time was, we simply provide the mechanism. We are simply deliverers. We are not responsible for the content on our, uh, uh, our, our, our systems. And I find that the, their uh, approach disappointing and negative. Uh, the way we dealt with this, uh, uh, and it was a UK-wide basis, we dealt with that through uh, the uh, Downing Street, through Gordon Brown, through uh, a, a Professor uh, Barron, who set up a report and came forward with a series of recommendations, and the Prime Minister got involved, and the Prime Minister had the power and the authority and the effect to bring uh, the progress on that issue with the big internet providers, most of whom were based outside of the UK uh, in the US, and made progress on issues around uh, uh, suicide chat rooms. And I think that that is an, a, a signal lesson here, and I think it's clearly the way that the UK is going, that this is a UK-wide issue, and that the measures that you can put in place uh, have to be in a partnership uh, with other governments within the UK, and indeed, uh, and particularly government in Dublin as well. And I think all of the, the, the issues around the sexual exploitation of children, 
Uh, those who abuse children don't respect borders. Those who abuse children uh, uh, are, are liable to skip. They don't. Uh, they, they move from one jurisdiction to another. So the lesson I think was always the partnership approach, partnership within our own our, our own executive. And I think on this particular issue, the lead has to be uh, with uh, justice. Uh, because this is first and foremost a criminal issue, a matter for police and courts, but it is also a matter of all other departments within uh, uh, the executive working together to ensure that we prove our proof as far as we possibly can uh, that the environment for our children. This is a heinous situation, a heinous crime, uh, and uh, it is, as we have seen recently, the uh, in the matter of. Remarks to close. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. It's a matter, we were looking at care homes, but of course, care homes are only children in care homes are a small part of up. this, and it is a wider society issue. And partnership is the key, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Call the Minister for Culture, Arts and Leisure, Ms. Killen, to respond. Cormagat, uh, last can call you. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, or do go and boy his a horch Dave, August Bowai Lumtaki at the horch, Dunroon, August and Turish on the question. Uh, I thank you all for your contribution to the debate thus far. And from the outset, I'd like to say I fully support and welcome uh, the report and indeed the recommendations and support this uh, motion. I, I particularly want to thank the chairperson and the members of the CAL committee and indeed for the staff, the assembly staff and research staff, for the huge effort and time that you have all put in to making this report, I believe, one of the most significant to come through the assembly in this mandate and explain why. I think there is yet another um, aspect of this report. Certainly, I have literally just received it and, as all would appreciate, it will take some time to disseminate, but certainly um, I believe that it is obvious that not just the, the, the chair, the members of the committee and the staff, but even the witnesses, the many groups and individuals and organisations who came in person to give evidence and to submit evidence on their views on this issue has been prevalent throughout this debate. And because of all this, I think it's incumbent upon me and the department to take this and look at it properly and make sure it gives, it's given the, the due time um, and consideration. I'm also grateful to the committee for having uh, allowed the officials to make a presentation on this subject, and I do welcome the debate and the contribution from most of the members who spoke purely on the, the committee report. Let me also say from the outset that I've always welcomed the decision by the committee to undertake an investigation into the gaps in child protection and safeguarding. I think it's all our business, regardless of what department we have responsibility for. Many thousands of children and young people, and indeed vulnerable adults, and many across the board, enjoy taking part in culture, arts and leisure activities every day and every week. And we know that parents appreciate, I as a parent and as a grandparent, also appreciate her much support, and it is important that such participation is for a child's health and personal development. It is these positive effects can only take place if the activities are in the right hands and in the right circumstances. And with those who have placed the welfare of all our children first and foremost and adopt the practices to support, protect and empower them. That is why it is important that all these activities take place in an environment where our children, young people and adults are safe from the possibility of any form of ill treatment or abuse. DECAL is committed to developing and implementing policies and procedures which ensure that everyone knows and accepts their responsibility in relation to their duty of care. I am committed to ensuring that there are correct and a comprehensive reporting procedures that promote good practice and sound recruitment measures for all individuals working or volunteering within this sector. This is one of the reasons why I asked officials last year to undertake a review of the Department Safeguarding Policies culminating in the publication of revised departmental safeguarding guidance in July 2013. It should also be noted that although DECAL rarely provides direct services to children, some of the functions and those of many of our partner bodies involved in contact with children and young people that has been raised throughout, particularly in reference to the ALBs. Very briefly. 
you. I appreciate the Minister giving way. Would, would the Minister agree with me that the, the key thing in this issue is a balance? And it's a balance between um, the protections for children, young people, and the vulnerable within, within society that we're talking about here today, and also the practical uh, solution that is to be found to ensure that we manage to recruit volunteers to keep these organisations going. Because if we can't rec recruit the volunteers, whether it's coaches or volunteers in youth organisations, frankly, they'll, they'll collapse. I totally agree with the member, and I will touch on this later. But just to, um, I mean, I think Anna Lowe raised this point. Um, and I mean, just for the record, I thank the 11 members who have spoke so far, and particularly those who aren't involved in the committee. Uh, but the point that Anna raised, I mean, it is really important. Most, if you look at sport, but it's not just exclusively sport, you have arts and cultural groups, many of which provide their activities through their voluntary contribution. We rely heavily on them. We need to give them better support in order to meet these, I think, are essential criteria. I'm not suggesting for a moment the member is suggesting that the balance would be that you compromise. I, I accept that fully. So we need to make it easier and we need to make sure that people accept the, 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 the essential criteria in providing these activities uh, and that they support it in doing so. And if the Anna in particular has any details that she'd like to share with my officials, my door's open at any time. Um, it is important that we, that we do uh, look at the safeguarding guidance that and I think that's what the member's getting at, that has been comp compiled to support our partner organisations. It seeks to establish best practice in the area of safeguarding, not only within our ALBs, but also extend to extend our influence across the wider culture, arts and leisure sectors. One way in which we can extend this influence is through the distribution of public funding or the commissioning of services for children and young people. And this guidance requires organisations seeking such support to have robust and effective policies and procedures in place which safeguard and protect children and vulnerable adults. And I understand the point that members have made regarding to uh, self-employed uh, or private practices, and that is something I believe we need to come back to in more detail, because we need to make sure that there isn't any gaps that people uh, can use in order um, to inflict harm or uh, abuse on children, young people or vulnerable adults. DECAL will monitor the safeguarding arrangements through regular governance and accountability meetings with our ALBs. We give that commitment to do that on a regular basis and safeguarding forms part of the department's risk management processes, providing assurances that there are satisfactory safeguarding measures in place across all our ALBs. In addition to these governance measures, DECAL has previously commissioned the Education and Training Inspector at ETI to undertake a review and follow-up inspection of the child protection arrangements in the sample of our ALBs. The inspection report found the quality of safeguarding arrangements and all of the sponsored bodies inspected to be satisfactory. It would be our aim to make sure that that is much more improved. But what about the individuals, as I mentioned earlier, working <coughs> excuse me, or volunteering in the sector that fall outside of our influence? I think it is important, uh, and that members are conscious of this, that we need to be mindful of the remit that, that DECAL extends to. However, I think that I accept the point that members are making in terms of looking where, where gaps may prevail. I would also welcome the fact that the committee in its report appear to have considered and recognised this as an issue. I also see that there are recommend, recommendations aimed at other government departments and indeed local government. And as the members are aware, the Office of First and Deputy First Minister has strategic overall responsibility for children and young people in the North, as does the Department of Health, uh, Social Service and Public Safety is the lead department in terms of vulnerable adults, but it is everyone's business. And Michael Majumsi pointed out that he believes that justice should lead in this. I understand the member's concern, making sure that there is a standardised approach to this. But I am making a commitment that I will talk to my executive colleagues, meet with my executive colleagues on the basis of this report and subsequent recommendations to see what we can do to make sure that all the good practice even going back to the last mandate, and the example you give around suicide prevention is an excellent one. We need to make sure we do all we can to you know, make sure that, first of all, the, the vulnerability of children and young people is decreased and that we provide the best possible protection for all. I would also say that this collaborative approach is essential. I, I take one of the key recommendations in the report, and this is one which refers to the charter mark. I understand it's not a new concept, given the Department of Health uh, you know, looked at uh, the PUCFA uh, accreditation scheme, and there's also schemes 
and others um, as examples, but I do believe we need to work towards uh, a charter mark or a recognition that certain um, the best possible standards of child protection have been undergone by groups. At, I think that's for parents, guardians, grandparents. You know, expect least to see when they're trusting your, their, their children's safety uh, with others. It is a complex issue, and what it does highlight is that it demonstrates again for me the need for a collaborative, collaborative approach. I also see from the report's recommendations that my department has already made progress on and others offer the opportunity to work with the RALBs and partners to enhance current arrangements, and I welcome that. I hope, um, I would just like to repeat again that I do believe that this is one of the most significant reports coming through. I believe that the protection of children and young people and indeed the protection of vulnerable adults and individuals who are vulnerable is something that we can't do enough of. And rather than just uh, using words, I'm really um, excited about the potential that we collectively across the executive can close gaps implement where possible the, the committee reports, perhaps even strengthen where possible some of the other recommendations. But certainly I'll be bringing this back in early January with a detailed response. I'm delighted that most members recognise the importance of this debate and indeed of this report. I believe it was a pity that at least two members chose to make party political remarks, one of which is a decal committee member. Uh, and given the importance and the commitment that I am placing in this report and this debate, I believe it was crass, totally crass. Uh, I think the remarks from the chair of the Edu Education Committee um, were regrettable and very disappointing. I'm glad the DUP's class clown has left the Assembly. I believe it was totally unbefitting of this debate. I really can't understand. Are you? Are you? Order, please. I would remind the minister and all members to be very careful in how they describe other members. I appreciate that. I withdraw the remark about the class clown. But what I would like to say is, I can't for the life of me understand the commitment that the chair of the committee and the commitments she's had over previous years around safeguarding around children's issues allowed that to sully this debate. I believe it was an inexcusable move that she's done. And given the nature and the severity of this uh, committee report, and given the importance of this debate, I, I think it's totally disappointing. But with that said, I support the motion, support the recommendations in the uh, committee report, welcome the, the contributions that the members have made, believe that most, if not all, made them for the right reasons, and look forward to rolling this process out in the future, and hope that we can use this report to work with other executive colleagues to strengthen what I believe is one of the most important issues that we all face and the challenges that we face, and that is the protection of children and vulnerable adults. Thank you. Order. As question time begins at 2 p.m., I suggest that the House takes its ease until then. This debate will continue after question time. Uh, when the Deputy Chairperson of the Committee, Mr William Irwin, uh, will conclude and wind up the debate on the motion. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise as the Deputy Chairperson of the Culture, Arts and Leisure Committee to support this important motion. I'd like to start by thanking the other members for their contributions today, to today's debate. I'd also like to join the Committee Chair in thanking the Minister for responding. As has been said by so many members today, this is an extremely important issue, and it cuts across all departments. I'd also like to echo the Chair's thanks to the members of the Committee and the Committee staff and all the individuals and groups who contributed to the investigation uh, with either written submissions or giving evidence before the Committee. Mr Speaker, it is clear that the Committee's investigation report has proved to be a very valuable piece of work. I know that the Committee will work hard with the Minister to ensure that its recommendations are implemented. As has been said from many of the speakers here today, the Committee's main purpose in undertaking this investigation was to look at gaps in child protection and safeguarding in the culture, arts and leisure remit, and then to seek out examples of best practice in the area by putting these together. The Committee has developed a number of recommendations which hope to close these gaps. 
Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, throughout the evidence gather, gathering process, the committee has heard a good deal of, from individuals and organisations about the excellent work that is undertaking regarding protection and safeguarding across the Cal remit. Many here today have highlighted the great work done by the CPSU, and I would also like to offer my congratulations to Paul Stevenson for the difference he has made in, in sport. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, the Committee Chair referred in, in earlier to private tutors and small groups operating across the Cal remit who are unregulated and unaffiliated. These groups were very much in the Committee's mind when it decided to undertake this investigation. These individuals and groups are often unsure about protection and safeguarding issues, and the Committee believes that many of its recommendations will help them. Particularly the Charter Mark Standard, as the Chairperson has indicated, it will provide a beacon for protection and will highlight recognised standards and best practice. It is to be hoped that this sort of seal of, of approval will be something that the unregulated individuals and groups will feel that they need to be part of as parents. Uh, we'll, ask the, we'll ask of them if they belong to it. The Committee wants it to become a must-have for anyone working with vulnerable groups. At this point, I want to expand on the issue of what vulnerable groups actually means. This is a phrase that the committee heard a number of times during the evidence sessions, and members engage in a great deal of discussion about who exactly falls into this category. The committee sees vulnerable groups being inclusive of all children and young people, and also adults with disabilities, with special needs, or with vulnerabilities, and those with greater exposure to risk or harm. So often when talking about protecting and safeguarding, we forget adult groups. However, I am sure that all of you have been aware of the media headlines around the abuse of adults in care for situations. In many ways, they are just as vulnerable as children and young people, and in some cases more so. One of the best ways that we can get the protection and safeguarding message across to those who need it to hear it uh, is through education and awareness campaigns. The Committee has made recommendations that will address this. In addition to the Charter Mark Standard Pilot, there will also be an awareness raising campaign. It is to be hoped that these will provide, prove to be a useful way of reaching out to the self employed persons and unregulated groups who work with vulnerable groups. I want to stress that the Committee does not want to demonise those, those unregulated individuals and groups who work with the vulnerable. Members realise that in the vast majority of cases they simply want to do their best that they can. The committee recommendations are designed to help them do that. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, during the evidence gang process, the committee reached out to local government. The committee has made it a practice to engage with local government as a key partner of the Assembly. Members understand that councils have considerable involvement in the activities undertaken with vulnerable groups. They therefore have a vital role in helping to protect and safeguard those groups. The Committee believes that local government must be a partner in the process of standardising our approach to, to protecting and safeguarding vulnerable groups. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I am no expert in the internet or social media, nor do I have special expertise in the use of high-tech devices. However, like many members during this debate, I acknowledge the huge role that these play in our daily lives. Through my, through my constituency work, I have heard the worries of parents and teachers about the problems that the internet and social media can cause. Do not, don't get me wrong, they can provide lots of benefits, however, there are also many dangers. In recognition of these dangers, the Committee has recommended that the Department plays a full part in the Executive's development of an e-strategy and should consider one of its own for the Cal family. The committee chair has also highlighted the need for a safeguarding portal. As she indicated, this would be a link leading from websites that people might use for information about protection and safeguarding issues to up-to-date policy and procedural information. In making its recommendations, the committee was very aware that young people need to have a say in protection and safeguarding. The inclusion of their voice will promote greater relevance. Therefore, the committee has recommended the establishment of a young person reference group uh, would give young people a, a voice in key policies and strategies, including the development of policies and procedures for protection and safeguarding. 
Such a group might even be able to work on a, a virtual basis, as the Chair has suggested. This would allow for its membership to be considerable and would reflect the way that young people like to work. And as the Chair has said, such a young person reference group would also be part of a charter mark standard pilot within the CAL sector. The Committee is very much aware that it is not undertaking this investigation in a vacuum. Members are all clear that a great deal of work is, on, is undertaken in all, in all the departments of many organisations regarding the protection and safeguarding of vulnerable groups. Therefore, as the Chair has indicated, the young person group should work with the existing frameworks and advice and cooperation to avoid duplication. It is to be hoped that the Committee's recommendation that the Department liaises with the Commissioner for Children and Young People regarding the establishment of the reference group will mean that it does not duplicate the work of other bodies and that it is, liable, or that it is able to work closely within the networks. As the Chair has already said, and as many other members have re repeated, we must not forget the amazing work done by volunteers. We must also ensure that volunteers do not find protection and safeguarding policies put them off the great work that they do. The tremendous volunteer volunteering that went on during the recent World Police and Fire Games provides a wonderful example of how vital these people are uh, to many activities. Many of the things that enrich the lives of vulnerable groups would not be possible without the help of volunteers. We must ensure that they are protected too. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, we must ensure that volunteers are always kept in the loop, receive the best and most up-to-date training and retraining that we can provide, knowing the correct policies and procedures and having a clear idea where they can go for information and help uh, will allow them to feel more secure as they undertake their important work. We live in an ever-changing world. Technology is constantly moving on and ideas of protection and safeguarding are too. This is, a particularly true, this is particularly true with regard to the internet and social media. It is difficult to keep up with the latest trends and gadgets and popular social media sites. Parents, teachers and carers often feel confused about how best to protect those they look after from the negative aspects of the internet and social media. The inevitability of information and regular training, the availability of information and regular training is the best way to ensure that we do not fall far behind our young people. The quality of the debate today reflects just how important the Committee's investigation has been. However, this is just the beginning. These issues do not stand still, and the Committee looks forward to working with the Minister and her Department to ensure that those who are vulnerable in our communities get the best protection that we can give them. Members uh, made a number of very useful comments during the debate, and I have decided uh, these. Uh, I have divided these into a broad, uh, into broad themes: uh, the charter mark standard coordination and standardisation, internet and social media, and impacts on volunteers. Many of the contributors today agreed that the development of a charter mark standard for protection and safeguarding is an excellent idea that deserves further consideration by the minister and could be developed in such a way that it is transferable to other sectors beyond culture, arts and leisure. Anna Lowe described the Charter Mark as an innovative idea, and the Minister considers that it would be a best practice standard that organisations aim for. Members are very supportive of the Committee's recommendation of an awareness-raising campaign to accompany a Charter Mark pilot. They also voice support for the Committee's recommendations around a website link to inform on protection and safeguarding, and a smartphone application that would offer the same access, offer the same access to information. Contributing members recognise the need for and benefits of a standardisation of policies and procedures and a coherent approach to the protection and safeguarding of vulnerable, vulnerable groups. Mr. Hoshin uh, commented on support of the committee's recommendation for a CAL reference every two years to discuss issues of protection and safeguarding. A conference like this will allow the, exchange, allow the exchange of best practice and experience and will promote standardization across policies, procedures and training. Some members also referred to the benefits of taking a cross-departmental approach to protection and safeguarding 
and could also include local government. A number of members referred to the dangers presented by the internet and social media. At this point, I'd like to respond to Mr Story's query about whether the cyberbullying issues referred to in the report are linked to school-based internet access. The information in the committee's report is based on the use of internet and social media uh, on personal devices. However, the committee cannot state without doubt that inappropriate activity does not happen using school-based equipment. This issue may well require further investigation by others. Members supported the development of an e-strategy by the Executive. Almost all of the contrib contributors paid tribute to the excellent work of the volunteers across all sectors. The committee heard of examples where volunteers worked at their own expense to ensure that they were properly trained. Members expressed concern that this should be the case. It is possible that this kind of expense might deter volunteers and members. Uh, highlighted, members highlighted this as an issue that needs to be resolved. The committee welcomes the Minister's clear support for, this, for the report and its recommendations. Indeed, the Minister described the report as one of the most significant to come before the Assembly in this mandate. The committee also welcomes the Minister's commitment to talk to her executive colleagues about how the recommendations can be taken forward. The Minister highlighted the potential for the committee's suggested charter mark to become a best practice standard. The Minister highlighted the re-establishment of her Department's Safeguarding Working Group. The Committee is pleased that the Minister and her officials have already begun work to support the Committee's recommendations. Once again, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I would like to thank the Minister and all the members who have contributed to the debate today. I support the motion. Thank you very much. Order. And the question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. And the next item on the order paper.